Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining um, on another session with Dental Shadowers. My name is Crystal, and today I'll be hosting a session with Dr. Melissa Williams, who is a general dentist from Florida. Uh, whenever you're ready, Dr. Williams, you can take it away. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So my name is Dr. Melissa Williams, um, and like stated, I am a general dentist and today I'm just gonna kind of go through my journey. I've had a very interesting journey uh, in dentistry so far. I graduated from dental school in 2012. So I've been practicing just shy of 12 years. So uh, I hope to inspire some people, um, definitely hope to answer any questions you may have. So let's just get started. All right, so my pathway um, to where I am right now, I'm an owner of a private practice called Cypress Cosmetic and General Dentistry. And um, I attended undergrad at Florida A&M University, which is in Tallahassee, Florida. And then after that, I attended dental school at Nova Southeastern University. I'm a Florida girl, so my goal was just to stay where it's warm. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And in between just this, uh, so many jobs, I've, I've worked in so many settings, but intentionally. So um, we're gonna talk about that a little bit and then to show you where I am right now, which is in private practice. So private practice was actually my last step in my journey at, at, for where we are right now. So some of the settings that I've worked in are military. I did um, locums for a couple of years. So I practiced in different states. I've worked in nursing homes prisons very briefly. Um, of course, I've worked in corporate. I'll talk about that. I worked as an associate in private practice and then now working as an owner dentist in private practice. So the photo you see there is just my reception area in my practice. Um, and let's see, we're going to talk about academics. So of course, we know that's major. If you want to get into dental school, the numbers are up there, but it's not the end all for everything, um, but it is a big component. So um, what I did, I, I went to Florida a and like I said, and one of the major programs at FAMU is the pharmacy program. So I knew I wanted to be a dentist, but there was no pre-dental program. There was nothing that was like created as, you know, there you have your pre-med track. There wasn't a pre-dental track. I don't know if there is now, but there definitely wasn't back then. So looking at all of the different programs, pharmacy was one of the more rigorous programs where you got most of your courses done in your first two years. So my goal was, all right, I'm going to take pharmacy, knock out my sciences. And um, after that, either I'll continue or if not, then I'll change my major. So pretty much um, I was done with most of my prerequisites for dental school in those two years. But there were, I think, three courses that I had to take on my own. And that's a very important thing is whatever schools you're looking at, from the very beginning, look at what the requirements are. So every program has like kind of the same core classes, but there are some schools that required additional courses. Um, I mainly was looking at UF and Nova Southeastern. So I had to make sure that even outside of my regular coursework, I got in what other courses I needed in order to um, apply for dental school. So after I did the two years in um, the pharmacy program, I was not about to continue pharmacy. So I switched to Allied Health, which I have a bachelor's in um, health science. So during that time, I took the DAT twice. The first time, I will not lie to you, I just went and took the test. I just went in there like a crazy person and took the test. So I did not prepare. I really didn't prep much. I didn't study. And uh, that's kind of how I went through life before that. I just would show up and take tests, right? So I was like quickly humbled and I was like, okay, just joking. Definitely got to prepare for this, especially we know the perceptual ability part. So took it again and I got an 18, which I was like, oh, that's fine. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what the scores are right now. I think I'm seeing way higher numbers than that. But at the time I was good with the 18. Um, so I applied to dental school going into my senior year and I got, uh, not, not, not accepted. I got interviews at a couple of schools. I went to two interviews. Nova Southeastern was my second. I got an acceptance letter and I was good. I was done because I just knew I wanted to stay in Florida. So for everyone, that journey can look a little bit different, but I knew like I was going to stay in Florida if I could. And, uh, once I got offered a seat there, I was done with the interviewing process. A lot of the schools were up north. 
And I just felt like I was not going to do well if I was up north in the cold. So that was just my personal decision. Um, so in undergrad, I graduated magna cum laude, and I definitely will say very, very heavy, uh, very heavy emphasis on getting good grades. Like I went in my first year like a beast. I did not play around. I established a high GPA and I man maintained my GPA, which made it better at the end because I was able to kind of coast at the end and I knew like, okay, I was going to be okay. But very important to have balance. So of course, I still had a social life. Um, you got to volunteer, find things that you enjoy, find things that you like, but find ways to do community service that really never goes away. So that's a really important thing that you want to have on your um, on your resume. And then, of course, just social activities. So, you know, one thing when you go to interviews, they're going to always ask you, what do you do outside of academics? Because they want to know that you're a well-rounded person. They want to see what your interests are and even some of your other skills. So um, that's something that I just really think is important. Uh, for college, this is kind of piggybacking on what I said, work hard and play hard. I definitely put my books first, always. Like my family does not play. There was no time to not be having good grades. But with that, I also found time to have a lot of fun, create um, connections with people, making lifelong friends, things like that. So especially in dental school, you guys will see as well, dentists were very stressed. And so when we're not working, we're having fun. I can promise you that. Like we're always, is one or the other. Um, research, so whatever classes you need. And you can major in things that are not science related. And I'm pretty sure people have talked about this before. Sometimes that will help you to stand out when they're looking at applications, as long as you're excelling. So you want to make sure you're doing well, but you got to get those sciences in one way or another. Um, and business for sure. If you can throw in business in there somewhere, it is going to come into play in your future. So, I mean, that would never hurt, but it's not that you have to, you don't have to major or minor in business. My biggest regret after looking at everything is actually not taking a gap year. So I know a lot of times we're just on this like grind and it's like, I want to finish. I want to graduate. I want to get into dental school. For some people, you may get in on your first um, shot. For some, you may not. You may, may end up doing a master's program or something like that. And I want to really stress this point that it's okay. And whether your gap year is by choice or maybe it's not, I think that we should normalize it just a little bit more because what happened when I went into dental school was burnout. Burnout is real. And it made that transition a little bit difficult. So looking back, one, you're, you're going to be in school for four more years at least. You may do a residency, and then you just start working. And once you start working, you don't stop working. So if there are things you want to do, if there are things you want to pursue during that time, whether it's traveling or, I don't know, whatever it is, it is something that I encourage. Not, a, you know, of course, it's a personal choice, but... Um, I don't think people talk about that enough because you're going to go into a very, very rigorous program. And like I said, once you start, there's no stopping after that. So whether you have to work on yourself um, just personally or academically, whatever the case is, if you take that gap year, don't feel bad about it. So at Nova Southeastern, um, I think like most people, I was like, I want to be an orthodontist, whatever. Quickly, I was like, no, no ortho for me. And that's not bashing ortho at all, but there are so many cool things you can do in dentistry that I realized like, nah, that's not what I want to do. So I was, like I said, I hear just being completely transparent. I was an average student. I was not at the top of my class for like the first time. I was very average. And not that I didn't know things or understand things, but I, I think I was just honestly burnt out. Like I was just like, whatever, I was over it. So um, your last two years are more clinical. And that's where all the fun is, like when you're actually working on patients. But the first two years are critical. That's the foundation for everything. So this is why I say know yourself and just kind of make sure you're preparing yourself for the long game. Um, I will say while you're in dental school, Definitely take advantage of any rotations, any specialties, whatever they are offering, 
take advantage of it because it's there is an ice cream truck <laughs> in my background. <laughs> But um, with the rotations and, and all the extra courses that you can take, you're still under the supervision and the like the nurturing side of your professors where you can learn things, you can ask questions, you can make mistakes. So it's it's the time to really, really, really just dive in. If you have an interest in surgery or ortho or whatever the case is, you want to find um, the, the rotations that are offered that you can take advantage of that extra training. So by my fourth year, though, I, I loved crown and bridge in dentistry. So I pretty much knew if you're doing crown and bridge, you're either going to be a general dentist or you might become a prosthodontist, but I, I didn't want to do pros only. So um, I also loved surgery. So with knowing that I liked different things, being a GP is kind of the way to go, because from there you can create your own practice you can create or your style of practice and really focus on the things that you love you do have to have a broad understanding of kind of most procedures but what you really market yourself for and what you focus on that's up to you so you guys will kind of see um over the next couple years my career takes me in all kinds of different places but it it has formed me to be the clinician that I am now so my next step, I did do an HPSP scholarship with the Army, and for obvious reasons, because they pay for dental school, and especially because I was going to Nova, which is a private school, it's super expensive, that was a bonus for me. Um, so when you're in dental school, you first get commissioned into the Army, so you are contracted already, you get commissioned as a second lieutenant, and you will earn a stipend while you're in school as well, so I never had to worry about like working or you really can't work not really but um I didn't have to worry about finances while I was in dental school and then once you graduate uh you get commissioned again and you're a captain so you just kind of get thrown into the army as an officer or into navy uh air force whichever branch you're an officer and um it is it was I would say a very interesting experience but focusing mainly on just the dentistry aspect I got to do so many cool things while I was in the military. And again, I was in a setting where I was able to practice um, with the supervision of dentists that had been practicing for years and years. So it was like a really cool learning space. Um, so let's see, let's go to the next one. So some of the things that I did, these are um, us in just different settings, personal and also when we're in uniform. But um, all kinds of, of just training I got outside of pedo because I wasn't in any location where we saw kids. So I was on the forensic dentistry team, which was something I always wanted to do. Might sound weird, but I just always had an interest in that. So I got to do that while I was in the military. Definitely a bit bittersweet kind of job. But again, it's just something very unique that I don't know where I would have been able to do that otherwise. Um, a lot of opportunities for leadership. So I was the officer in charge uh, at both duty stations that I was at while I was in the military. And that's a really important thing. I mean, you can gain leadership skills in many ways, but when you're the dentist, you're the leader. And that's just something that if you're not very comfortable with leadership, um, you know, even finding things now that can help you start to develop those skills, because you have to take leadership, whether it's clinically with your patients or with your staff. And not in a way where you're a dictator or anything like that, but just learning how to be an effective leader as well as being a clinician. So I also was um, an instructor for the Red Cross Dental Assisting Program. A lot of opportunities to teach, a lot of opportunities to train, pretty much anything you wanted to do in the military. If you were interested, you could, you could pursue that. And of course, I made friends for a lifetime. So being a, a captain after dental school, we were 26, <laughs> we were officers, we got to practice. Our day was very short though. We, we finished work at about four and from there we were able to have a lot of fun. So practicing with people that were my age, we were all learning together, we were developing, we were growing. It was actually just a really awesome experience. So after the military, oh wait, I'm kind of skipping a slide. So a typical day for a general dentist, there is no typical day that does not exist. Every single day is different. Even if you 
only do a certain type of dentistry, no day is predictable. Like you just don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so I put a note on here, explore different, different clinical settings. I very much so encourage people to just try different things to see what you really like. And you can create your idea of the perfect job. So this photo right here is my practice in just the gray shell stage. So I, I put this in just to emphasize that it was nothing. It was nothing but a dream. It was just only what I could imagine. It, and I had the ability to create not just a physical space uh, that represented you know, what I wanted, but also to create the type of practice and attract the type of patients, do the type of procedures that I want. So dentistry is very unique in that way where you can create the world that you want. And that's super important when it comes to the longevity as a provider, because again, burnout is there. Um, sometimes you can get bored. So always learning new skills or honing in on the things that you wanna do. It's important to know that you, you can make it whatever you want it to be. So some of the other places that I worked, um, just going along with that same theme, was uh, I did travel dentistry. So it's called Locum Tenens. I did travel dentistry for about two years uh, after I got out the military. And this, I have some videos about this. You can kind of look up if you're interested, but this was probably the, oh, this was probably one of the um, best decisions that I made to do because after the military, I didn't quite want to commit to like one practice. And so doing travel dentistry, it allowed me to work in different settings. I was able to see different office systems and kind of start to get a feel of what type of office I really wanted to be in. I got to travel. You get paid a lot. It's always good. Make money. Um, and just in, in general, it was just a lot of exposure to different populations. And with different pa uh, patient populations, you're always going to get um, more like different experiences as far as procedures. So your skills starts, you start to diversify your skills a lot. So I loved doing travel dentistry. I highly encourage it. And the unique thing is that when I was in dental school, this concept was something that people did typically at the tail end of their career. So when they were retiring, it was more common to do um, travel dentistry. Now we're seeing a shift where younger professionals are doing it at the beginning of their career. And although you may feel like, I don't have that much experience, it really doesn't matter. Uh, well, it matters, <laughs> but you you grow. The whole time you're a dentist, you're growing. So, you know, you just you work at wherever you're at at that time, but it's a really good way to just kind of see the world for what it is. So after that, um, I came back to Florida and I did another kind of travel dentistry that was like local, but basically I would go as the dentist and go to underserved areas. So places that had limited access where patients can't like get up and go to you. So primarily nursing homes, but I also went to prisons. That's definitely a, like a, I don't know, you got to be a special kind of person, I think, but it's really cool. You're very safe. Um, it's just a little bit stressful, like going to prisons is stressful. But nursing homes in particular, I worked on a, a course like more of elderly population, and that was something different. That was something that I hadn't really done. Um, when I did travel dentistry, I did some pedo practices, which taught me that I did not want to do anything with pedo, not because of anything bad, but I just knew like that wasn't my personality. And um, and then after that, I kind of focused more on, on general practices, but I didn't have a lot of experience with the elderly. So while I was doing nursing home dentistry, that was the main focus. And I think you brush brushing up a lot on certain skills, even um, when it comes to like pharmacology, understanding medications that patients are on, their medical conditions, all of that is really important when you're treating elderly patients. So it was a good experience. It wasn't long lived, but it was a good experience. And I also was an instructor again at a, a dental assisting school in, um, in Florida. So mainly on the clinical side, but it was pretty cool because we had a clinic attached to uh, the dental assisting school and the students were able to go directly from their classes and then do their clinical portion with me before they went out on their externships. So they had a, a higher success rate just having like a home uh, dentist there. So I really enjoyed that. And that's another thing that you can always do if you're a dentist is 
if you're into teaching, you can explore that avenue of um, teaching. That's always a need. So more recently is where I ended up in um, corporate dentistry and then also working as an associate dentist. So the main difference, corporate dentistry has grown a lot. Uh, it's kind of, I don't know, it's a, a heavy hitter in the dental game now. And a lot of us go into corporate because honestly, you can make a lot of money. I won't lie. I'll talk about money a lot because I think if you go into dentistry, you do like money. But of course, making it the honest way, you don't have to like be shady to make money. So corporate dentistry, you're going to get paid, but they are going to work you like you. There's normally like a expiration date on corporate because you just see so many patients and it, it becomes very challenging, like just physically uh, challenging. So very fast paced environment. Now, some people like that very fast paced. Now, a benefit is that a lot of times you collaborate with other doctors, you have access to specialists like right on hand. So that's great. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's just a personality thing, how long you can last in corporate. So associates, uh, working as an associate, normally a little bit more calm, more personalized dentistry. Some people stay working as an associate for years and years, and that's fine. Um, and then just making sure you're, you have the right contract, you've negotiated the right things. It can be a really, really good opportunity. A lot of people also transition into eventually acquiring the practice from the owner. So that's one avenue that people use when they're interested in um in going into ownership, but they don't necessarily want to start from scratch. So now today, I am a practice owner, um, and mine is an actual startup, like you could see in that picture. So being an owner is, that was ultimately my dream. Um, and I knew that that's where I would settle down. Uh, but it's it's very challenging. It's rewarding, but it's challenging. And one of the reasons is, you're put in a position where dentistry is not your only focus, like not even a little bit. It's probably the smallest thing that you worry about because you have so many other hats and so many other responsibilities, especially um, in ownership is where the leadership comes back into play. Business, business skills. I mean, if you don't learn it, you're going to learn it in one way or another. You're going to learn it. It doesn't matter. Um, and it's just a... It's a uh, humbling, like I said, but very rewarding experience. So I'm still in year one of having my, my private practice, a lot of um, getting over a lot of humps, a lot of bumps, a lot of hurdles, but we're, we're getting into that, that like smooth sailing type of uh, position now. So I'm really enjoying it. Um, now this is important when, as we talk about shadowing. I know that whenever students, like, they'll contact me, they talk about shadowing at my office or whatever. And of course, you want to be in the back. You want to be where the doctor is. You want to see the surgeries. You want to see all the cool stuff. And that's cool because you do need to know what you're getting into. Of course, the smells, the sights, the personalities, everything. You need to know what you're getting into. But my one piece of advice, and I cannot stress this enough, if you think at any point you want to own a practice, when you're shadowing or if you get a job um, in a dental office, I would strongly encourage you to work in the front. That is really where you're going to learn the business side of dentistry. It's where you're going to learn the insurance side of dentistry. And if you're not in the front, you just don't know what's going on. So that's going to give you an upper edge when it's time to have your own practice, or even if you're working in corporate, it's really important to understand what's going on in the front so you're not getting cheated on your money. So a lot of people, like I had a student recently that uh, was in my office, and I, I said, I think you need to spend some time in the front, one day a week, spend some time in the front. And I know that they were giving me the side eye, like, mm, I'm not trying to do that. But I'm telling you, if you can spend any time shadowing admin, shadowing the front desk person, the um, person who does treatment plan presentation, any of those skills, that's going to be something you just put in your pocket and you'll see in your career where like all those skills will come back into play. And I, also with business. So any courses or anything you can do with business marketing, those are going to come into play as well. Those will help you in the future. All right. So what kind of procedures do I perform? 
as a general dentist, the truth is a little bit of everything. However, my emphasis in my practice is more on certain procedures than others. So in general, um, smile makeovers are great. That's what we all want to do. Implants for sure. I love surgery. So anything surgery related, um, yes to, but particularly implants, that's the way of the, the present and the future. Um, crown and bridge. I told you that's my first love, crown and bridge. Veneers. Now I have a love hate hate relationship with veneers because of course we see everybody that and I don't know they think they can do veneers from the internet, but um, veneers are of course a, a big money maker. Um, it's one of the most technique sensitive procedures that we do in dentistry, so a lot of skill required with veneers. Um, it's very rewarding, but it's it's um, one that I I would say case selection is very big, so I don't always take on veneer cases. We do a lot of whitening, of course, um, root canals. I'm not a fan of root canals. I do what's necessary. The rest I refer to the specialists and surgery in general, and then aligners. So as a general dentist, you can perform orthodontic procedures. It's based on your training. So I offer aligners. I do not do metal braces, and that's my preference. I, I feel like if a case requires the brackets, I'm sending them to the orthodontist. Um, a common theme that you'll learn in dental school, especially if you're a, a GP, is knowing what you can do, knowing what you can do well, and knowing what you can do at the same level as a specialist. So if there's something that I feel I cannot do it at the same level as a specialist, I'm going to refer because that's what we have our specialists there for. And the more that you practice, the more cases you take on, the easier it is to to know if it's something that you should do or if it's something that, you know, you got to send them to the big dogs. So aligners for me are my my sweet spot. But um, if it's anything else, then I send them to an orthodontist. So just some examples of procedures. I didn't really do like um, cases per se, but whitening. So like I said, that's that's just a big thing. It's an add-on. And I try to, to push whitening on most of my um cosmetic cases because patients will normally say they're fine. And then once you start working on their teeth, all of a sudden they want to do whitening at the end of treatment. So it's something we typically talk about at every exam appointment for a new patient. We'll ask, we'll show them like what their starting shade is. We'll show them where we can take them with whitening, kind of talk about the benefits of doing it in the office as opposed to just over the counter. And um, it makes cases come out a lot better a lot of times when patients do whitening. So in the first photo, this is a patient, the top picture is her teeth are actually the whitest natural shade. So as far as teeth go that occur naturally, her teeth are at the whitest shade. And we were able to bump her up. It was about two shades more into the bleaching shades. And that's something that a lot of patients don't know because now they assume that your teeth are supposed to be like paper white, which is not true. Um, it's something we can do, but it's not the norm. Um, so this is actually a harder case of whitening than one on the other side, which those teeth are clearly yellow. And then you can see where we got them white. It's a lot easier to do than someone that's already just at such a vibrant color. So on the other case where the patient has the more yellowish um, appearance, the thing with whitening that's really important, and it's why we push for patients to do it in the office, is to figure out why the teeth appear the way that they appear. So it can be uh, sometimes based on how much enamel or how translucent their enamel is. It's showing the dentin that's underneath that's yellow. It could be actual intrinsic staining in the enamel. It could be just regular staining because they drink a lot of coffee or they smoke. So the first step is just figuring out why the teeth appear the way they appear, figuring out what you have to do to get them whiter, and then figuring out which type of material you're gonna use. So that's something that's really big in school as well. You're gonna take, um, you're gonna take uh, dental materials like every year. While you're in school, it's so annoying. You're like, why do I have to know this? But it is, it's everything, it's everything. You're gonna use that every single day. Understanding your materials, knowing when it's appropriate to use them and why we use them. So on these two patients, I use two different products and it's because we were trying to do different things. We have to whiten their teeth differently. 
All right, so these are two cases where I was closing spaces. Um, one is she still is in the temporary phase. The other one we just completed recently. Now, these are cases where closing spaces we ideally want to do with ortho, but a lot of times patients, they don't have the, the patience and they don't want to do ortho. So then you have to say, okay, how can I actually do this? Can I close these spaces, make it look normal, make it look natural? So the first case where she's in um, temporaries, this one is a is a very interesting case because she's missing the tooth next to her central, which is the lateral. She's congenitally congenitally missing that tooth, and um, we have to fill in spaces and change the shape of some teeth to make it look like she's actually not missing anything. So symmetry is a very big thing. If you can get the, the center of someone's smile to look normal, the rest kind of fades, fades, right? Our eyes just kind of focus in the middle. So we turned her canine into a lateral. We closed spaces a little bit on each tooth. And right now she's been in temporaries for a little while because we have to test if that bite is gonna be successful. So a lot of times when people see cases online or they just see like before and after, they don't know all the stuff that goes behind it. And we can easily add things to places and like make something look really pretty. But in dentistry, aesthetics matters, but more than that is function. So if the function is not there, if the jaw does not support the new function that you've created, your case will fail. So in her case, where I'm adding in material in places where there's never been, her teeth have been used to sliding through those spaces, we're now creating like a block there. And we have to test if that is going to be successful. So she's wearing those temporaries for, uh, I think we're going to have her in there for about another two weeks, which would make it about two months in all. And we've had to make modifications through that time. So as she's eating, as she's talking, as she's using those temporaries more and more, it lets us know how we have to modify her smile before we make her final restorations. On the other case, this is another one of closing spaces. Again, the patient didn't want to do ortho. So um, we did veneers on this one, just four veneers, and we closed some spaces that she had in the front. Now, this case was a little bit challenging because when we do veneers, we normally want patients to do 10 on each arch. Um, it's just easier to do, the more veneers you have, the more equal they can be, and you're able to make all the changes that you need. When you're only doing two veneers or four veneers, you have to kind of make something work within whatever they have already. So this was a case that we just finished recently. This next one, so this is um, a bridge that this patient has. So she already had a bridge. She had maybe two bridges before and she did not want implants though. So she was like, I just want a new bridge. Now on one of her teeth, you can see there's darkness. There's some staining there. She's had multiple restorations and a lot of work done on that tooth. So it was a very fragile tooth, but we're able to save it. And basically we reprep the teeth, remove all decay, and with a bridge, those crowns are all connected. So um, they are not able to floss in between those teeth. They can floss underneath the bridge and they can floss on the edges, but a bridge is a really good way for us to be able to restore someone's smile, replace missing teeth without them having to do implants or undergo surgery. Because a lot of patients, they just don't want to undergo surgery. All right, now this is a part of, of uh, general dentistry that I don't think people talk about a lot, which is um, just perio. Cleanings, deep cleanings. It is the foundation, the gums and bone are the foundation for everything that we do. So one of the things, uh, when I opened my practice, I've always had a hygienist. I never did cleanings myself. Come back around full circle, probably since dental school, I haven't done cleanings myself. In my private practice, I do my own cleanings and deep cleanings, and it's I've found that it's actually been a really good thing when it comes to practice building and um, building more trust and a better relationship with my patients. But also, it's very rewarding because you get to see the transformation that you have with patients in, in actually a very simple procedure. So this patient um, is a fairly young patient and not what you would expect. So they basically, it started with pain 
And I think on that side, they just kind of stopped brushing in a certain area because of pain. And that's actually very common. You'll see that. So over time, though, I, I just think a lot of factors came into play and we got here. We got to this place. So when the patient came to me, they basically thought they would have to extract all their teeth. Um, they thought that it was pretty much hopeless. But looking at their x-rays, they had they still had a lot of bone. They had really long roots to support their teeth. And while they had a little bit of bone loss and they had a lot of buildup, there was no need to extract anything at all. So I talked to them about periodontal disease. Um, patient education is huge. Talking to your patients, getting them to understand what's going on, what their diagnosis is, and what we do about it. And it's a very big commitment when a patient has periodontal disease because it's something that you're going to be maintaining and managing for a lifetime. So the patient was on board. The patient had a very, um, I could tell they were very motivated, high commitment level to just changing things. And we did a deep cleaning. So this was the right side, upper, lower. We did that in one appointment. And then two weeks later, we did the left side. But the right side was worse. And the picture um, that you see, the after photo, is immediately after the cleaning. So while there is some redness in the gums, that's to be expected because we're, we're really getting down in the gums, you can see how beautiful and healthy their teeth are. You can see just um, in a couple of weeks, like the, the, the gums completely regenerated, those red bands were gone. And even just the patient's confidence level in a matter of an hour and a half was totally different. So we stress a lot of times the really glamorous procedures, but these are some of the things that we do that change people's lives. And there's really no procedure that's better than another, because if you're doing what the patient has come to you for, if you're able to get them out of pain or you're able to bring them back to health, you're able to make them smile again, which sounds very cliche, but if you're able to do something that's going to really change that person, it was a success. And this is now one of like my most loyal patients ever. All right. So we're talking about extractions. Like I said, I, I love uh, extractions. I love surgery in general. Now, this case was um, it was an interesting case. This patient came in. She was having pain and she was pointing to her molars. So we actually took an x-ray more focused on her molars and I'm looking at it and I'm like, eh, looks like you might be biting kind of hard. There may be something going on in that molar, but not really, not to match her symptoms. So a big part of dentistry is listening to the patient's symptoms, listening to the words they're using, listening to how they're describing their pain or their discomfort, because those are all going to be really important in figuring out what's going on. Now, this tooth is a premolar which is one of the ones that's actually cut off on this x-ray because we weren't focusing there. But the more and more she talked, I'm like, mm, I don't think it's your molar. There's something else going on. And of course, we're right by her sinus cavity as well. And so pain can be just everywhere when it's in your sinus cavity. Um, or you may have a sinus infection. It could be a lot of things. So as I'm looking, we always take photos of patients. So that's an intraoral photo that we took. And on that premolar, it's not even that obvious, but her central groove just looked wider than normal. So I go in with my Explorer and the second I touch her central groove, I mean, she just jumps out the chair and I see the tooth just kind of like open up real quick. So I realize this is a cracked tooth. It's completely cracked. We can't restore it because the tooth just, I mean, it just separated. The gums were keeping it together and the pressure and inflammation that was caused from the tooth flexing, it just went everywhere. So it, it, she couldn't tell where the pain was coming from. So ultimately we let her know tooth has to be extracted. Um, the plan, we did, a, we did the extraction last week, did a bone graft. We always do bone grafts with extractions. And she left with just a, a temporary flipper. And then once she heals, we're going to place an implant. So when I extracted the tooth, now, of course, I want to know that my diagnosis is right, even though I was sure of it. But we always clean the tooth, inspect the tooth to make sure that we're seeing, you know, what, what matches up with the diagnosis and the patient can see that as well. So when I hold it up, just, you know, just looking straight onto the, the biting portion of the tooth, you can see that crack, but on the side is where you can actually see how far down that went. Now this premolar has, in theory, two roots that are fused together. 
And so it's split just right in the middle of those two roots. And once it gets down onto that root structure, there's nothing you can do to fix that tooth. It has to be extracted. So when the patient saw that, she like everything kind of made sense to her, all the pain and everything that she had been experiencing, because she even went to her ENT because she was having so much pain and just thought it was her sinuses. So that was a pretty cool case. And here we have, um, this is an, oh, another fractured tooth. So this one is a molar number three. This tooth was split down the middle again, patient bit on something, a uh, tooth fractured. And so we did an extraction. Again, we did a bone graft and this implant I placed on the same day. So there are times where we can place the implant immediately. There are other times where it's better to let the area heal and then we go back in and place the implant um, after it's healed. But in her situation, I was able to get enough stability. We did a bone graft and then we suture it up. These are um, non-resorbable sutures. So these will last for, typically I'll leave those in for about three weeks to a month. And um, in this case, we place a healing abutment and that is just gonna sit there and that will heal for about three months or so before we're able to do the crown on there. So I always keep implants in the office because there are times where, yeah, a patient walks in, they got to get that tooth out, but they're ready to get something back in. So although she won't have a crown there, she still has something where she's setting herself up to replace that missing tooth. And that's a really big thing that I stress with my patients. Whatever we take out, we got to replace. So having that conversation with them. And um, we normally go over their different options, which would be implant, bridge, or something removable. Most patients nowadays don't like removable. So we know we're focusing either on implants or a crown and bridge. Um, this case is a, okay, so this is a full mouth restoration case that the upper is complete, the lower is in progress, but it's a really cool case. This guy, very unassuming, you would not think that he cares about aesthetics at all. However, due to having some fractured teeth on the upper, we did crowns on all of his upper teeth. And once we did that, it changed his smile, it changed his swag, it changed everything. And he came back immediately and was like, I want to do my lower teeth, which is, this is very common. Most people care about their upper teeth, but when they can see the potential for how their smile can look, they'll normally come back and do their lower, or it could just be finances, whatever. So on his lower, you can see he has a whole lot of crowding here. It looks like he has too many teeth, but it's the right amount. They're just really, really, really crowded. So um, one, because we have crowns on all the upper, we decided to crown all of the lower. And I also had to alter his bite a little bit. So in the next photo, you can see where we've prepped every single tooth. Now there are times that we don't do all the preps at one time. In this case, I did. Um, now I don't do that as often though, because it's a lot more complicated, but we prepped all the lower teeth. I did an extraction on one of his anterior teeth. So that one that's all the way like forward, we extracted that one because honestly, I didn't need it. It's not functional. It's not doing anything. And again, in dentistry, a lot of times we play with illusion. So when you talk about your perceptual ability portion of the test, that's where the way your mind thinks, what you can visualize, visualizing things that don't already exist and understanding spatial relationships, it's important because you have to kind of create and visualize things before you physically do it. You use your, your physics knowledge, you use all your other skills to make it happen. But if you can't visualize it, it's not going to work. So we removed the tooth that we didn't need. And here on the bottom, he has a temporary, those are temporary crowns on the lower. So you can see um, we push that tooth back into the arch. And once all his bite is balanced and everything is ready to go, we scan it. And then he's going to have just full arch crowns. So that's a really cool case. I think this is the last one. I'm pretty sure. This was another just smile makeover that we did. Um, this patient had a very gummy smile very long teeth, rectangular shaped teeth, two teeth were rotated. Now for me, I did this case maybe three or four years ago. If she were to walk into my practice today, honestly, I would have made her do aligners or I would have strongly, strongly, strongly recommended 
that she do aligners before we do the final restorations. Because when I look at this, her crowns are still, they're not perfectly aligned. So again, you evolve as a, as a clinician, you grow as a clinician. And I think even your confidence changes over the, over the years. So if she would have walked in my office now, I would have treatment planned her case very differently. But at the time, she didn't want to do ortho. She just wanted her teeth to look better. And so we decided to do crowns on them. Now, her smile is still a gummy smile, but even with her teeth looking different, she smiled different, which is interesting. So you don't you don't see the gums up there. And in this case, we wouldn't have really done like a gingivectomy or anything because her teeth were very long. So we don't want them to look longer. So it's another interesting case. Um, but this one I, I always just reflect on because it's, it just shows sometimes your growth like hmm, what would I have done differently? Now, the patient was very, very happy, but I just know that we could have gotten like like optimum results had she done some aligners beforehand. Okay, I think this is the last one for real, for real. So this is a removable case. And I show this just to say, um, again, we do a lot of crown and bridge implants, things like that, but sometimes people just don't have the money or they just don't want it. So in this case, this is another young female patient now I can speculate why her teeth are like this, but I'm not going to say without certainty. Um, but she had a lot of fractured teeth, a lot of missing teeth. So the two, the first two photos are pre-op photos. You can see she only had a couple um, teeth remaining on that upper arch. Very thick bone would have been great for, for implants. However, she just didn't have the money for it. So we did, um, we did what we call immediate dentures. We took uh, impressions first of her teeth, her bite. Um, and then on the lab makes the dentures beforehand. So pretty much immediate dentures, I like to call healing dentures. Um, a lot of times the patients will need a new set after about nine months to a year, but it's a great transition for patients who have not many teeth or have a lot of teeth and then are going to nothing. So on the surgery day, we uh, extracted the remaining teeth and the roots. I did, um, I uh, did, um, oh my goodness, I just had a brain fart. I basically had to smooth out her bone because a lot of times the bone is very like bumpy. So we smoothed out her bone and we delivered the immediate dentures. So in the, the final picture, that's her smile. She wanted just a very natural look, um, not super Hollywood white, but it looks really good with her smile, the shape of her lips, it looks very natural. And she got her youthfulness back. So although we knew she was young, she didn't appear young because of all the missing teeth. After that, shortly after this picture, we went back in and we did her lower. So this is another case where first she started with the upper and she came back like maybe the next month and we did her lower. All right. So that was it for some of the clinical stuff, um, just to kind of give you guys an idea of all the different things that you can do as a, a GP, just based on your interests. So some skills, though, that I would say are really important if you think you're going to uh, be a GP is surgery. Whether you like extractions or not, whether you think you want to do like extractor molars or whatever, surgery is really important when it comes to other procedures because you have to get those teeth out. And we really focus on atraumatic extractions. So the cleaner you can get a tooth out, the better the final outcome is gonna be, whether you're placing an implant, you're doing a bridge, um, whatever you're doing, you always wanna set yourself up where you're preserving bone. And again, just even for the, the patient, you don't want it to be you know, traumatic if it doesn't have to be. But when we say atraumatic, we're talking about the actual bone and everything around the teeth. We wanna preserve that as much as we can. So understanding surgery, getting those rotations in, just learning as much as you can while you're in school, that's going to help you a lot in your career. And then also just getting patients out of pain. When you have emergency appointments, those are great appointments because when patients come in, they're ready to do treatment right away. You don't have to convince them of anything. They are ready. But a lot of times getting out of pain, getting them out of pain either means root canal or extraction. So you have to be ready, like at the drop of a dime, like just to do an extraction if necessary. And there are times where you still may have to refer them to a surgeon, but in an emergency situation, if you can avoid that, it's going to be better because that person wants care right away. And you also will gain a patient for life. If you can get someone out of pain, they will stick with you for life. Um, if you have an interest in aesthetics, 
crown and bridge is going to be something you want to focus on. Uh, if your school emphasizes veneers and cosmetic cases, I would definitely take some on while you're while you're studying. A general understanding of ortho is definitely up to you if you want to offer ortho in your in your uh, future. However, just understanding the fundamentals of it, and again, a lot of times now we incorporate ortho with a cosmetic case. So it does mean the case is going to take a little bit longer, but the outcome is always going to be better. So ortho is still something that we have in our back pocket for when we need it. Understanding occlusion. So just the, the laws that we have to respect when we are doing these full mouth restorations and these full, full mouth rehabs are really important. Occlusion is a course you'll take and you're going to hate it when you're taking it. But it is the basis of everything that we do because we can we always have to um, the things that we do, we have to create no harm. And so when we try to do things that violate physics and violate nature, that's when we run into problems because the patient, their body is going to tell you and it's going to reject whatever you did. So when you're taking that occlusion cap class in dental school, just remember, like, this is really important. And lastly, I mentioned this already, understanding dental materials. So you got to know the science behind whatever you do. Science is everything. And also instruments. We use so many instruments. It's not even funny. So many materials. Unlike specialists that focus in on just one procedure or one group of procedures, we have to have stuff for everything in the office. So stuff for root canals, extractions, crown and bridge, um, cosmetics, ortho, like we have such a wide armamentarium. So everyone has their preferences on what they like to use and what they like to practice on. But again, that's where that exposure comes from. When you're in different settings, you see different instruments, you learn different materials, and that's how you kind of create, you know, your way of practicing. Oh, there we are. We're at the end. So uh, I guess we're going to open up for questions now. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Williams. You have a lot of questions um, coming your way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I I'm gonna... way longer than I thought. I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. Um, I'm going to start with the first question. It's okay. how uh, could you do pedo when you were doing the travel dentistry without specializing? Okay, that's a great question. So just in general, as a um, general practitioner, you can do things within your, your skill level. So when you're in school, you're going to learn pedo. Like you're going to learn it on kids for sure. I got a contract where um, the pediatric dentist had a, a just really emergency situation, had to step away for their practice for what I thought was going to be a week. And it turned into like a couple of months. But within that, I still did the things that I felt comfortable with. So I didn't, I did nitrous, but I didn't do any kind of like um, actual sedation. Um, I did the procedures that I felt comfortable with because it still is general dentistry. It's just that you're working on a child. So a lot of times I will say during that period, I had to study a lot. Like when I would go home, I would have to pull out the pedo books because um, measurements are different. The amount of, you know, anesthetic or different things that you're using is that that's what really matters. So it's a lot of just you're always learning, you're always studying, you're always researching. But whatever I knew I was deficient in, I would make sure like I was prepared. I would look at the schedule. What do I have coming up this week and make sure I was prepared for it? But the, the dentistry is still general dentistry. And then anything else, if we needed to refer, I would refer. But I also learned I didn't want to work on kids. And now in my practice, I don't treat kids at all. So. Um, the next question is, I'm currently a pre-dental student in Orlando. Are you familiar with any um, nearby dental assisting schools that I can look into? Um, if I can, that's the question that I would rather, if I can like send an email or something, is that possible? Because off the top of my head, I think there are a lot in Orlando actually, but as far as what's reputable and what's, what some of the things you want to look at is, um, are they able to place you when it comes to getting hours afterwards? Um, what is the, the success rate as far as people getting jobs afterwards? So I would prefer to do a little bit of research on that to make sure that I'm actually like giving good information. Okay, so whoever asked that question, if you could stay back at the end and then we can get your contact information um, uh, to you. Uh, mm -hmm. The next question is, what do you recommend students do with their time during a gap year? I would say sleep, travel. <laughs> 
But seriously, it depends. It just depends on why you're taking a gap year, what your goals are, what your finances are, like if you can afford it or your parents will support it. I honestly would say travel or start a business, do something that um, is something that you just want to do. If it's for academic reasons, you know, definitely get into a program. A lot of those master's programs are great feeders to get into dental school. They'll, you know, reserve seats for a certain number of students in those post back programs. So anything you can do to strengthen your application. But again, my reasoning for, for wanting that, like wishing that I had done that was just the burnout. Because once you graduate, you're going straight into working or residency. Residency is rigorous. After that, you're working and you just keep working. Like I remember when COVID hit, and I mean, not to be insensitive, but I remember being happy because we were able to pause. Like you just keep working. So that's the reason why I say if you have to take a gap year, it's not the end of the world. And a lot of times the students that I knew that had that break before they started dental school, I feel like they just, you know, they had a different kind of momentum when it came to first and second year because they they had that pause. So it's just up to you. Um, the next question is, do you have any advice for succeeding in dental school academically? You just got to study. <laughs> you got to study. But um, I can only speak for Nova and I can only really speak for my year because each class has a personality. I will say my class was a very close class and that's something to look for when you're going on interviews. Try to talk to the actual students there and get a feel of do they work together do they study together? Do they help each other? There's the class above us in particular. They were a very competitive group. They were very savage. And at the end of the day, I think it made their experience harder than it had to be. Whereas my class, we had study guides. We would all share with each other. I was one of the, the main note takers. My notes would get dispersed for everybody. If anybody um, was good at a certain thing. So when you're in lab, you spend a lot of time in the sim lab together. We had groups, you know, you you form bonds with these people. And I think even outside of school, it's important to have fun together as well. Um, there's a lot of things that just like in the workplace, there are things that happen outside of the workplace. There, you know, they say uh, deals are made on the golf course. It's the same kind of thing. So if you can build that bond with your classmates, have that support, that camaraderie, you guys work together, it's already going to be competitive. But at the same time, everyone has different goals. So we knew the people that were going into the military, we were on a different path. We knew the people that wanted to do ortho, hey, do your thing, that's cool. We knew the people that were going to, you know, a GPR in New York or whatever the case was, you know that pretty early on. So you're competing, but you're not always competing. And I think that you just your personal drive, your personal motivation, studying, you just have to study. I mean, there's no getting around it. The clinical skills you have to practice. There's no getting around that. But the thing that I think really makes it different and makes it um, just better is how your class is going to be. So definitely focus on that when you guys go on interviews and get a vibe for just, you know, how that school is fostering those type of relationships. Um, the next question is, did you ever consider any other careers like becoming medical doctor? And what made you choose dentistry? That's a good question. So no, I did not want to be a medical doctor. In my family, um, I'm Jamaican. And in my family, everyone, we either were going to be a doctor or a lawyer. So they didn't specify what kind of doctor, but you had to be a doctor or a lawyer, right? So we have a lot of lawyers, attorneys. I was like, that is stressful. Y'all are type A. I'm good. I don't want to do that. Um, so then it was medical, right? The lifestyle of a medical doctor was not really my thing. Dentistry is way more flexible. If you're on call, that's because you're an oral surgeon, most likely, or you choose to be. But I mean, when I leave the office, outside of me now doing admin, like when I leave the office, I'm, I'm done. You know, you have your weekends if you don't want to work weekends. I take I only work four days a week. That's been my practice for years now to only work four days a week. Um, so I saw the flexibility aspect. My other choice would have been plastic surgeon, however, is a little bit vain of a field. So I was like, all right, I like dentistry. You can still change lives. 
um, a lot of cosmetics involved in dentistry, a lot of cert like hand skills, and I still had that surgical component. So dentistry just checked the boxes in general. And like I said, just depending on what you're looking for, you can find it in dentistry and you can make money. That's important. Always make money. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is, does your office currently have a limit to how many students are allowed to shadow you at a given time? Oh, Lord. Well, at the moment, I actually have no students. Um, it just depends on what I have going on. But the most I would have at any given time is one like on a particular day because I am I'm still seeing patients. But if a student is there, like I'm teaching, I can't help it. I'm, I'm going to be trying to teach. So I did have to step back a little bit with having my my practice and being in that first year. I'm just spread very thin. Um, so I am open to it if a student wants to shadow, but I, there are some parameters for sure because I just have to make sure that I'm still like handling business at the same time. Um, next question is, do you have any tips for dental school interviews? Well, I only went on two, like I said, so <laughs> not that much. Also, I don't even know what interviews are like now. Let's let's put that into perspective. But I think showing up as yourself is important. Your academics are already on paper, right? So you have to think about it. If you're getting an interview, they're interested in you. They have already seen everything on paper. What they want to see is you. And there may be some things they want to clarify. They may ask some questions, you know, like about your academics, if you have just something that seems, um, you know, off or whatever. But Honestly, they're interviewing you for you. They want to know about your your um, other things that you do, your extracurricular activities. They want to know about other skills you have. And like I said, with dentistry, a common theme you'll see, we all do other things with our hands. Like I love, I bake and decorate cakes. There's science, there's the creative aspect. I love anything beauty, like hair, makeup, whatever, I'm doing it. Like we naturally gravitate to things we're creating. So anything that you can do to showcase, I think um, I remember people would bring like their artwork, like if you have scrapbooks, if you paint, whatever it is, they want to see that because it's just showing that you have, you know, those those other things that are important. Also, your communication skills are very important in dentistry. I don't remember if I had it on a slide or not, but for example, I'm an introvert. And while I'm an introvert, when I'm at work, I'm forced to not quite be an introvert, right? One, people are coming to see you, but they're terrified. They don't actually want to be there. And they will let you know that. You have about five minutes to win a patient over and in a genuine way. So if you're coming off super salesy or pushy, that's not really going to work. But it's just you being able to bring forth your personality, your compassion, um, patients nowadays, they're looking for the customer service, the empathy, the, it's all the different components of you being more human. That's what they're looking for. And so the same thing in dental school, they want to know that you're going to be a successful dentist. They want to know that you're more than just straight A's, you're more than just a DAT score. It's like, what does this person have that's going to make them actually successful when they're out there in the world? So anything you can do to show that leadership skills, I can't harp on that enough. You got to be a leader. Um, and you can show that in so many different ways though. So, you know, just those are the things that you're going to want to highlight. And there are some schools that like I went to the temple interview, which was a group interview. And so sometimes they'll also put you in that kind of setting in a group setting. Um, there's a lot of psychology behind it, <laughs> but I think the more genuine you are, the better off you'll be. So if you're a goofy, silly person, be that, you know, if you're more quiet and timid, that's Okay. But you may want to be able to show, though, like, hey, I'm quiet, but I can still hold my own or I'm still very confident. I can still speak to people, you know, with confidence. Like it just depends on who you are, but you got to show it quickly. So, you know, if you have to practice your interview skills or um, maybe just jot down a few things that you want to make sure that they know about you, I think that that would be helpful. Uh, the next question is, were you nervous about applying or accepting the military program? Oh, my gosh. Yes. So I was bamboozled. <laughs> I actually, uh, one of my best friends, she comes from a military family and it was a no brainer for her. She went to Howard Dental, but like I said, her whole family was military 
And so she was like, yeah, they have a military scholarship. They'll pay for dental school. That was the first I ever knew about it. I didn't know about it. So she's like, just meet the recruiter, met with the recruiter. And I was like, okay, I mean, like, it's not crazy, but I'm going to be real with you. I'm not like a soldier kind of person, right? Like I got in trouble often for violating with my hair, nail polish, earrings. Like I just wasn't having it. So that aspect of the military was a challenge for me because I, I am not your, your typical soldier. But I also knew the benefits, like graduating without the student loans. I mean, come on. And then also just the opportunities that it would open. Um, for anyone that is thinking about it, I would say explore the different branches. So you have Air Force, Navy, and Army that all offer the same scholarship, but the numbers are different as far as how many scholarships they offer. And typically, Air Force has the least and they go the fastest. Um, so just depending on what branch you feel like you want to go in, you know, you can look at what their requirements are and, um, you know, it, it's a great opportunity. So like I said, if nothing else for the financial aspect, but some people, you, you just love that lifestyle. That's cool. Travel, gain all types of skills, practice without having to worry about money, insurance, billing, all that stuff. Like it's great. But I, I I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's not like I was just like, I want to be a soldier. Like that was not the case. But I don't regret it. I don't regret it. So if people have more questions on that, they can definitely hit me up for that. Uh, the next one's still related. Uh, do you have to apply okay. to the military program before applying to dental school? Hmm. I think no. If I remember correctly, I think I had to have an acceptance letter already. Or if not, I was definitely in the interviewing process. Reason being, you have to provide paperwork from your school. So as far as all the, the fin financial stuff. So I, I if I didn't already have my acceptance, it was kind of at the same exact time. Um, but also just for the purpose of being competitive, I would say if you know you want to go that route, get in talks with a recruiter. What you're looking for specifically is HPSP. So um, the Health Profession Scholarship Program, that's what you're looking for. It's for med, dental, um, physical therapy, a couple of other stuff. But you want a recruiter specifically for that. They have to know about HPSP um, because it's a very specific track that you're going through. So like I said, you, you already get commissioned as a second lieutenant. When you graduate, you're commissioned as a captain. That is not typical at all. <laughs> that is not normal. So um, it's just a very specific track that you're going on. But if you know you want to do that, like just get in contact with a recruiter ASAP. Um, next question is someone asked if they get a copy of your presentation, but um, this is also uploaded on YouTube. So if you want to look at it that way, that's available, but that's up to Dr. Williams if she does want to give it up. Yeah, I don't mind. That's okay. We can um, okay. email it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, we'll do that at the end. Um, the next question is, how do you begin the process for travel dentistry? Mm, okay, that this is a whole nother topic. So I'm going to try to keep it really short. But basically, um, there are temp agencies that you normally will, will connect with. Most of the times, the temp agencies all have the same contracts. So it's more of some are easier to work with than others. Um, some will pay better than others. Some you can negotiate a little bit better with. I worked for multiple temp agencies and there are people that also do it independently. So without an agency where they will basically send out mailers to um, different locations, different um, dental societies and say, hey, I'm available if you're looking for a temp dentist or especially region wise, places like Wisconsin, really rural areas, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, um, in the, you know, the Midwest, like they're always looking for dentists because they, they don't have as many, like, for example, as Florida. So for me at the time when I got into it, I was, I just got out of the military and I was still in North Carolina. So when you're doing this, I was able to get a license in North Carolina because of the military. But when you work in temp with temp agencies, they will also file on your behalf. So although I, I took, I don't even remember what it was called back then but I had a Florida license. And then after that, I was able to get North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, and um, and Wisconsin. Those were the, the main places that I worked. 
Uh, I think I actually know Georgia also. I don't have those anymore that I only maintain three now, but um, they will help you. So especially a place like Wisconsin, they will help you get a license so that you can practice there. And that's how I just kind of, and once you start and you get in with them and you have a good, um, you know, a good rapport, the offices like you, they're, they're giving positive feedback. It's something that you just, you know, kind of build on from there. I just, I do want to say really quickly though, if it's something you're interested in, um, I would want to talk to someone on the side, but negotiating contracts is really important. So this is another thing in dentistry, whether you're doing travel dentistry, corporate, um, or being an associate, your contract is everything. They will try to nickel and dime you and you have to know like what the indus industry standard is. You have to know what your worth is based on your experience level. You have to look at things like the cost of living, wherever you're going, or whether it's hotels, are they going to give you rental cars, like all that stuff. You have to kind of do your research or else it's not that it's not that good of a deal. So negotiating is another thing that I would say if you're if you're thinking about doing that, you know, maybe take some courses or read some books, because if not, you can get really screwed. Uh, the next question goes back to the military. What was your hardest part about the time, uh, your time in the military? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, I don't understand. I was uh, the military for me. Yeah, that was um, that was interesting. I would say uh, running. I don't like to run or sweat. So running, that was one. Hey, if you like to run, you will love the military. They just run for no reason. Um, and this may sound really bad, but following rules. I don't like to feel confined and restrained. And that's everything that the military is, but not in a bad way. It has to be that way. So I knew for me that I was going to serve. I did four and a half years. I knew I would serve the four and I would move on. There are other people like my, my best friend who I talked about. She still is in the military. She's a major. She specialized. She's a periodontist, all for free. And she's living her best life. Her husband is in the military as well. You know, it's just really a personality thing. So it was more like just the actual soldiering that I did not enjoy. But like I said, the experience is bar none. The next question is, how do you pick your staff? When you find out, let me know. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> Choosing staff is not easy. Um... I'll say after COVID, things are very different. And I mean, I feel like I sound like an old person when I say that, but it's true. The workforce is not the same. So it has been a little bit challenging, actually. Um, I like a diverse staff. So seeing representation like with from the front to the back, I think is important. My patient base, uh, my narrow, my primarily uh, Black patients, whether it's American, Jamaican, Haitian, and then also Hispanic patients. So for me, having that representation is important, um, but also people that are able to communicate, they know their stuff, um, they're reliable. Do you show up to work every day? That's important. Um, so it's, you know, I have some good staff members, but it, it's challenging. And I mean, you're competing with a time where, this is another thing to think about. You're competing with a time where people are now used to working from home, in healthcare, that doesn't apply to us. Um, there are some front desk people that work remotely, but it's kind of weird. So you have to have people that are okay with that. Like when all their friends are staying at home and just logging onto a computer, they're getting up every day, they're showing up on time. You got to be there, not even on time, you got to be there early. They're, you know, organized, they're prepared, they're, you know, just professional. So I would, that's where I say it's a little bit challenging now because just the, the workforce is different and the way that people work is different. Um, but there's always people that are looking for jobs. So, you know. Uh, we have one more question. Um, what do you look for when approached by upcoming students foreshadowing opportunities? What do I look for? Hmm. I think it's kind of hard to say. I think this is the same as as job interview. You don't really know what you're getting until they're just in there, right? Um, 
but I will say, for example, the student that that was my last student that came came very professional, like um, with resume in hand, which I just wasn't really expecting. Um, asked to speak to me, which a lot of times if someone just walks in and I'm with patients, you know, I'll say just email me or whatever the case is. But um, I don't know, just something about their presence I was very impressed by. And I knew that they were serious. I talked to them a little bit to see what their timeline was as well. And um, this person actually had already, was already pursuing a total different career and then changed. They were just like, no, and decided they wanted to do dentistry. So I thought that that was really important because one, they've already kind of tried something before and realized like that, that wasn't where their passion was. But then I think it's important to be able to know that this is what you want to do. So I don't have an interview process. It's not like that, but I, I do feel like, um, you know, just someone that's very serious about it. Someone that wants to learn. Cause if you're there, I want you to be taking in what's there. Like I said, take advantage of the front, take advantage of the back. Um, very professional. And my students, I still have them talk to patients. Like I want to see, you know, you, you get comfortable communicating with patients that you can't really do that much when you're shadowing. But the things that we can do, I'm going to push you to do. So if you get real nervous or squeamish, I don't know, they'll come to my office. <laughs> we did have one more question come up. Um, are you familiar with pre-dental or the dental students who followed the research path um, in comparison to a traditional professional path? Mm, I actually am not. I can't really speak on that. I'm trying to think if I know... I don't really know anyone that really went just into research. I feel like with certain schools, um, if you do certain like residencies or programs, it's very research-based. So if that's an interest, I think that you definitely want to look into schools that have an emphasis on research. Um, but it, I would say that's not the majority. So I can't really say that much about it. We have one last question and then we'll end there. Um, what dress code would be appropriate for shadowers? So y'all, y'all really try to come to my office. Um, scrubs. I make I make shadowers wear scrubs because like I said, if we're in the back, like you're gonna be right here looking at this blood. Like so there's a it's weird. There's a lot of smells in dentistry, and smells are important. It it matters when it comes to a diagnosis sometimes. So if I have something interesting, like I'm gonna tell you, like get in there like smell this and one it might let you know like this lady is crazy and I don't want to do this because maybe it's too much you know there's some people that if you can't handle the smells the sights and stuff like that you're going to know that when you're shadowing you know you want to find that out very early but if it intrigues you if you're interested in it like yeah I, I want you to be all up in there so Uh, that was the end of questions. But again, I want to thank you, Dr. Williams, for hosting this session with us. It's very thank informative you. and um, we got a lot of knowledge from your experiences. And um, yeah, if anybody has any other questions, uh, you could stay back. All the people that did want to talk to Dr. Williams uh, for the presentation for email, um, just stay back after this and then we can get that email to you. But thank you again, Dr. Williams and everyone that has joined today. Um, that's Dr. Like my social TikTok. media is on there, yeah. but my email isn't on there. So yeah, we can share that though. Yeah. Um, this is her TikTok and her Instagram, uh, give her a follow and check her out. Um, if there will be an attendance quiz, um, yes, there will be, it's going to be uploaded on the link tree later today, um, with this on YouTube. So just be on the lookout for that. I'll post it in the group me. But uh, thank you so much for everyone uh, that joined today on our live session and everyone that will be watching later today. Thank you. Thank you.